February uh, 6th, 2009, and uh, we are doing a home interview with uh, Mr. Andrews, a World War II veteran. Uh, sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth? My full name is Harold F. Andrews. My place of birth was Albany, New York. Okay, and when were you born? March 26, 1923. Okay. Did you attend school in, in Albany? No, I uh, I was born in Albany, but my parents were living then in uh, Bennington, Vermont, and my father was a salesman for uh, Warren Marshall, a Buick dealer, and General Motors gave Dad a franchise in Hoosick Falls, and I lived there until 1938 when my father sold his automobile business and went back to farming in Eagle Bridge. And I was there, and that's where I enlisted in 1943. Okay, and uh, what year did you graduate from high school? 1940. Okay, and what did you do between 1940 and 1943? I worked in a factory, and I also worked on the farm with Dad. Okay, and uh, what made you decide to enlist? Well, the war started, of course, as you know, on December 7th, and mm -hmm. I was about that. In fact, an interesting little anecdote, I went to, to Washington County, had a uh, the draft board, and was run by a gentleman up around Fort Everett by the name of Gill, and I had to go see him in order to get released to go in the service. And he didn't want me to. He said, well, he says I was crazy because I could, I had a, an exemption by staying on the farm. Mm -hmm. But I'd already made up my mind, so that was it. Okay. And what made you decide on the uh, Army Air Force? Well, I'd always wanted to fly. I'd been an <clears throat> advocate of model airplanes for years. I built model airplanes from probably the age of eight and nine years old, mm -hmm. right up till I went in. And I just... It, it was a logical thing. And besides that, they told me that uh, I probably couldn't because uh, I didn't have a college education. At that time, you had to have a college education. And I went to Albany. I think I told Wayne that. And they sent me home and told me if it changed, they'd let me know. Well, I can't remember what how long it was, but right after that, or probably within a couple months, I got a letter in the mail that the, it had been changed and if you could pass the exam that they would give you, they would accept you into aviation cadet training. I went down, took the exam, passed it, and, and I think around January 43 they called me and I was uh, indoctrinated into the service. Okay, and whereabouts did you go for your basic training? Atlantic City. We left, a whole train load of us left from Albany. We went to Atlantic City and stayed there, I think, around two months, and then they sent us to uh, Classification Center. That's, I forgot really where that was. It might have been Nashville. Mm -hmm. And then they started shipping us. Yes, we went to, Nash I believe it was Nashville. Yes, we went to Nashville, and then they put you through the battery of tests and physicals and everything. And, determined whether you went to pilot school, brahmadeer, or whatever. Navigator? Yep, navigator. Okay. And I qualified for pilot training, so then they sent me to Bennettsville, South Carolina. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> what was your training like there? Did you start off with a ground school? Yeah, or? well, yes. Well, uh, Bennettsville had a beautiful little field. It was all grass, beautiful barracks. Uh, it was a really a beautiful place, and uh, we had pilot training, we had ground school. Uh, the, I think there was two classes there. I was in the class of what was called at that time 44E. That means you graduated in, in May of 44, because mm -hmm. they knew when you started how long you'd be there. Now, what kind of airplanes did you so, fly? Well, the, there they had nothing but Stearmans. There was Stearmans all over the place. Okay. And you had ten hours. If you couldn't, if you couldn't solo within ten hours, you were out. Mm -hmm. So everybody worked like heck and tried to get through. And most of us 
soloed, I'd say, be between eight and ten hours. Mm -hmm. And your instructor stood on the ground with sweat all over him while you went up and soloed. And you came back, if you made it back. As I said in those days, any time you could walk away from the airplane, it was a good landing. <laughs> now, uh, within that ten hour period, did you learn any kind of aerobatics or just the basics? No, you did pre pretty near everything. Uh -huh. they, they concentrated primarily, as an instructor will tell you, on looking around. That's the main thing. You look around, you always look for a place to, to land the airplane. Mm -hmm. Even when the engine is running fine, you always look for a place to set the old girl down. Because mm -hmm. you never know when one the engine's going to quit. But we did aerobatics, we did slow rolls, we did snap rolls, we did loops, we did emblemons. You did the whole ball of wax, and then you concentrated a lot on landings because you had to come back. Uh -huh. you could, it's easy enough to get the old girl off the ground, but to put her back on the ground sometimes is a little tough, especially with a steerman because she's a little bit high off the ground, but you could drop the steerman in from 10, 15 feet and she'd she'd hit and keep right on going. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, uh, but I think everybody soloed. I don't remember, I can't remember now because it's been 60, 70 years, but I don't think too many washed out. Uh -huh. I think they had them pretty well weeded out by the time they got there. Coordination was a big problem to coordinate the uh, single engine. Mm -hmm. Now after you soloed after 10 hours, did you continue to fly the Stearman for a while? Well, I don't think we did too much as soon as you got that done. Because if I remember right, you're there for about two months. Mm -hmm. one, one group would fly in the morning, groundwork in the afternoon, and then the other group, would, would it would just reverse. Mm -hmm. They'd fly in the morning and you would study in the afternoon. But I don't remember too much after you soloed. Uh, what you, I think you went on to, to, uh, to basic. Uh, the, the, the Southeast Command didn't waste much time. Mm -hmm. They needed pilots bad all over the world. And of course, CBI, outside of the American Volunteer Group, was about the only thing that was going in China at that particular time. I mean, the 14th Air Force was there, but it was primary fighters. Mm -hmm. All right, once, once you uh, finished your uh your basic, where did you go next? That was primary. Or primary. Then we went to basic. Okay. And I think that was Shaw Field, South Carolina. All right. And that was in the BT-13. I think it was made by Consolidated Balti. Okay. And that was a single engine? That was a single engine, uh, low, low wing. Uh, How did that compare to the Stearman? Flying. It was like riding in a beer can full of rocks. <laughs> it was that bad. Uh -huh. Rattled and banged. It was not. It wasn't a fun airplane at all. Uh -huh. But you weren't there to have fun anyway. I mean, you were there to learn how to fly that particular. Right? That didn't have a retractable gear either. Okay. But uh, it. But everybody made it. But but of course the uh, ground school. It got tougher all the time. Mm -hmm. You had to learn your hydraulics, your electrical systems, and meteorology was a big thing. You had it. We all became, I'd say, pretty good at predicting weather. And, mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, and of course, that was another. I think that's another two-month course, basic. All right. And once you completed your basic, uh, what happened next? Well, I think we had a furrow sometime in there, but I don't remember quite now when it was. And we went home for a few days, usually seven days or 14 days, and then he came back. And I think I came back and I had to go to Advanced, which was in Albany, Georgia, mm -hmm. Turner Field, in Albany, Georgia. And there they uh, switched us over to twin engine immediately. And Ooh. we flew AT-10s, which was a, it was a, plane similar to the Globe Swift. It was all plywood with rubber gas tanks. Was that uh, a lot more challenging to fly than the single engine? Actually, no. It was easier to fly. Was it? Yes. 
The, the only thing is you had to coordinate both engines. Mm -hmm. uh, a single engine was susceptible to ground loop, and a twin engine back in those days, the tail draggers were all subject were all subject to ground loops. Now, what do you mean by a ground loop? That's when the plane, if you come in, if the wind say is coming from the starboard side, the plane wants to turn to the starboard side, mm -hmm. which means you've got to put on right throttle. You've got to put on right throttle to hold it straight to go down the runway. Mm -hmm. In the air, the twin engine is easier to fly than a sing single engine. With a single engine in the air, you've got to coordinate rudder with, with your stick mm -hmm. so you don't skid. With the twin engine, no problem at all. You just sit there and just turn the wheel and she just flies like a bird. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just beautiful. And it, it was a good little plane and we did, uh, that's when we learned how to do night cross countries. And that separates the men from the boys. You really sweat those out because you, they they put two cadets in a plane and turn them loose at night, and all you got is a, the light in the cabin, a little light to run your maps and to find out and your beacons to stay on your beacons. And we did a triangular course from Albany, Georgia, to Macon, and I can't remember what the other leg was. Was was there any training accidents that that you recall? We asked there always was one. Well, we had a close call. My part, my the the fellow, he was also my roommate, and I can't remember his name. But they took two of us, and he was from Texas. And we did a cross country at night, and we had a hell of a time. We we weren't sure where we were, and you can't you can't see anything. You can't see railroad tracks. You can't see rivers. You can't see barns because a lot down there they had the name of the towns on a lot of the barn roofs. Mm -hmm. Well, at nighttime you can't see anything, only lights. So you better pay attention to your radio. But yeah. we made it and got back. But then we flew a daylight thing, and we had a fire in one engine. And uh, I was the pilot, and he was the co-pilot. Well, the, I think the fire was in our our starboard engine. I mean, the right hand side. We had an oil leak, and then we called a tower, and they said to turn around and come back. Well, my friend says, Harold, says, I hate to tell you this, but he says, the right engine's on fire. Well, in a plywood airplane, I mean, you, you feel like you're in a pile of firewood then. Mm -hmm. But we managed to slip the airplane, got it in and landed. Fire trucks came out, and we did well. From then on, we didn't have to worry about graduating. It was all set. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget that. Our our instructor said, well, you two guys sure made it back good, so that went down. Okay. That was a breather. Uh -huh. How many in your class graduated? I'd say darn near all of them. Uh -huh. I've got pictures, I think, of that class, too. Okay, and do you recall when you graduated? May 23rd, 1944. Okay. Once you graduated, uh, did you get any leave time? Yes, I got leave to go home. Okay. And you were commissioned at that point and yes, you received your wings? Right. You were commissioned. You were discharged as a aviation cadet. You had to have a discharge. Mm -hmm. And then you had a, then they swore you in again. They wouldn't let you out of the room. You 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 went out in one minute and then five minutes later you were Reinducted back in as an officer. Mm -hmm. Serial numbers changed everything. Okay. Did you have any family members present at no, all? No, no. My my father was. At that time, I was single, and my father and mother were up here in New York State. Mm -hmm. But I came home. I forgot uh, right after that, and I went back and. Uh, well, I. Graduated May 23rd. I must have went had about probably seven or ten days, and then they sent me back. They sent me back to Albany, Georgia, and I think, if I remember correctly, they told me I was going to be an instructor. Mm -hmm. But there was a turn of events. They put me in temporary duty in the engineering, and I wasn't there that long. And then they. Uh, told me that I was going to St. Joseph, Missouri to take transition in C-47s. 
which is the Douglas DC-3. Mm -hmm. Now, how many hours did you have at that point? Nah, not too many. I can't tell you for sure. Mm -hmm. I'd say maybe, I don't know. I would say a hundred or maybe less. Okay. So then you went to transition school? I went to St. Joe to take transition in C-47s. I not only took transition there, that's where I met my wife and we became married there when I was there. And how long were you there for? I'd say about another two months. Okay. And uh, uh, what, what, was, what was that training like? Well, that, that was a lot more uh, severe mm -hmm. and stronger than, uh, than the training to we had well cadets. Mm -hmm. There we were indoctrinated into hydraulic systems, electrical systems, safety systems, the whole thing. Contrary to public opinion, they think you walk out and get into an airplane and take off. You don't do that. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn how to fly the airplane, but you've got to know the airplane in and out. You've got to know the hydraulic systems, the emergency systems, and the, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have a check ride, as you well know, with a licensed pilot or, or instructor pilot or chief pilot or test pilot and he marks you one way or the other. How did you like that airplane? C-47 is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Still is and it always will be. Mm -hmm. All right, and once you uh, completed that phase, what happened next? Then they decided they sent me to, to transition at another school, so they sent me to Reno, Nevada, where they had a big base, and that's where they had the C-46, the Curtis Wright, mm -hmm. made by Curtis. The C-46 was a twin belly, beautiful airplane. The reputation it had was, I've told poor Wayne before, was not that great. Everybody was a little leery of it. But it turned out to be a hell of a workhorse. Mm -hmm. Carried a lot of freight, did a lot of work. Uh, that's the same airplane we used in India to fly the hump for all those years. Now, was your wife with you at that no, time? No, no. My wife stayed in Missouri. She was still in school, and I went on to there and took transition, and uh, that worked out all right. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the the, uh, the electronics and the hydraulics in this plane was a lot more complicated than some of the other planes because it was bigger. Mm -hmm. And uh, but when that when that was completed. Uh, they gave me a leave and told us that that probably would be our last leave. We probably, when we come back, we'd head for overseas. So Shirley and I, my wife and I, left, uh, I, well, I came back to St. Joe, where her home was, St. Joseph, Missouri, and we left there and came to see my parents, spent a couple weeks, took her back, and then I left for Nashville. Mm -hmm. I, my, my orders came through that I was to report to Nashville. And there I was, uh, I met there with our, our other, with a pilot who was a service pilot, and he was to be the first pilot, and they told us we'd have a, we'd pick our airplane up in, in Miami, Florida. Now, do you want to explain uh, what a service pilot is? A service pilot is a civilian pilot who has been rated by the government and improved and some were indoctrinated as flight officers. They were not military pilots, and they, they were excellent pilots, or at least the ones I was associated with. Mm -hmm. There were some that were taken, I think, that weren't as good as others. The one I happened to be with, his name was Milton O. Hopper, and he was originally a Pan American pilot and probably one of the best. <coughs> it breaks my heart a little bit because I've learned so much from him. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. Not a problem. Okay. Yeah, Hoppy was a uh, first pilot for, for Pan American. He was older than the, than the military pilots. At that time, I was only in probably around 21. Hoppy, I would say, was almost 40. Mm -hmm. But God, he could land an airplane like anybody I ever see. But anyway, 
we went to Miami and they told us we were going to take uh, C-46s and fly to Africa. But we weren't going the way we thought we were going. They sent us, and I can't remember how many there was of us, there was probably about at least four to five planes, each with a full crew, with a pilot, co-pilot, radio op, crew chief, and navigator. Each one had one. Mm -hmm. And we flew from uh, Miami to Trinidad, spent the night, then flew down to Belém, Brazil, stayed there because the weather was not good. We were to fly to the little island of Ascension in the South Atlantic. <clears throat> And we had stayed in Belém, I'd say, for four or five days until the weather cleared. And then we took off and flew across the South Atlantic. And our navigator was good. He hit, he hit the island square right in the button. We stayed there overnight, took off the next day. One peculiar aspect of ascension was the end of the runway was at a, in, was at a cliff. Mm -hmm. And the cliff was about 500 foot straight down into the ocean. If you didn't get off the end, you were done. Mm. But we didn't know that till we flew out over the end of the runway and could look down. <laughs> and there we were. But we flew from there right into Dakar, French West Africa, delivered our airplanes in Marrakesh, in uh, French Morocco. Mm -hmm. and, and then they took us by uh, vehicle to Casablanca, where we were barracked. Mm -hmm. We stayed in, uh, each crew was there, and they split us up, and then they put us on a uh, flight plan to fly from Casablanca to Cairo, Egypt. At, at this time I was in the Air Transport Command, which was part of the ferry group, I believe, and it was our job to transport people, freight, and, and all sorts of goods war materials from Casablanca right on through to Cairo. Mm -hmm. We even carried passengers. We, Hoppy and I, that was his nickname, the first pilot, we even flew some USO people. Mm -hmm. We carried Pat O'Brien from Casablanca to Algiers, I remember. And, and we flew from Casablanca to Tripoli, which was in Tunisia spent the night there, and then we'd take off, fly across the Bay of Benghazi, and land in Cairo. And then probably the next day or two days later, whenever they call us again, we'd turn around and fly back to Casablanca. Mm -hmm. We even flew a hospital ship once or twice. Poppy was a good pilot, and he got, he got some tough jobs. Mm -hmm. So what was your impression of uh, the countries in Africa? Did you en enjoy your time over there? Oh yeah, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of my favorite places in Africa, and Hoppies too, was in Tunisia. And then we used to stand at Tri Tripoli, and the Italians had had airplanes there be before the war. And uh, I loved the weather there. It was 70 degrees the year round. It was mm -hmm. just beautiful, and the, and the ocean was right there, and it was beautiful. In fact, where we stayed in our, uh, the, the British were already in there because they were driving Rommel crazy. And uh, Rommel's headquarters, they pushed him out of the headquarters and then the British took it over as a mess hall. Mm -hmm. So we used to, and it was a beautiful white marble building, I remember it perfectly. And we, we used to go there for mess once in a while when the British would let us in. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have much contact with the civilian population? No, very little. Okay. We used to see them on the streets, of course, and they would always, and the little kids followed you around, and we always managed to have a candy bar here and there. Mm -hmm. The poor little kids, they didn't, they didn't have much. Yeah. And the, the, it was the same in Casablanca. Ca uh, Casablanca at that particular time was a refuge for the French people. A lot of them escaped from France with nothing but, a lot of them had, all they had was money mm -hmm. and they took diamonds because the Germans wouldn't let them take anything else, but they, and they couldn't buy anything because there wasn't anything to be bought and they were just living from hand to mouth. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these people that were in Casablanca, which was a 
some section was a beautiful city, and then it had its poor, poor section too, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, we used to meet and, and visit with them. And, and a lot of the women, of course, they, they'd give anything to buy a pair of silk stockings. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the boys would try to find them in Cairo and take them back, and and they were grateful, but it was a it was a tough deal for them. Mm -hmm. At that particular time, I think the one thing that ruined a lot of soldiers over there was the fact that champagne was fifty cents a bottle. Oh boy! Because <laughs> I mean, it seems like the French got out champagne. I don't know how they did that, uh -huh. <laughs> but. Uh, I remember it was in, and Hoppy was still there, and I was still flying with him. That's where I learned how to fly th through thunderstorms. Mm -hmm. Now so, you you flew with a, a navigator too? No, no, no. After after we got into Africa and delivered the airplane, the navigators all disappeared. Mm -hmm. Then you did your own navigating. You did your own radio work. You did everything yourself. Mm -hmm you would carry a radio operator with you sometimes. Mm -hmm. Most of the time we'd have a radio operator because if you had passengers on board you had to have a pretty decent crew. Yeah. And we, we carried, uh, coming back we carried some officers that had been in China, in India, before I ever got there. And they were pretty tired, pretty wore out bunch. Mm -hmm pretty scared too because they didn't want to fly. They didn't think they were going to get home. Uh -huh. We brought, I remember Hoppy once, he says we got to pick up a, some uh, returning vets from China. And one of them I think was a Brigadier General and he was a nervous wreck. He was a nervous wreck. He kept coming up to the cabin and let know if everything was all right. Everything was all right because the, there was a lot of turbulence that day. It had been yeah. raining, been a thunderstorm, and we had St. Elmo's fire bouncing off the wings and the props. And he was scared, and he came up. And Hoppy told me, he says, Harold, for God's sake, go back and see if we can quiet the general down. <laughs> <laughs> but we got him back to Casablanca, and I remember when he got off the plane, we, Hoppy and I, were walking into the operations. And he, the general came over and he says, but he says, I really want to thank you for what you did. So I'll never forget that. Now, did you do much uh, night flying? Yeah. We, we flew a lot of times at night by, back and forth from Casablanca to Cairo. Mm -hmm. And that's where you hit these thunderstorms. You can't see them that much at night. So you fly into them and you're into them before you can... Uh, do anything about it. Of course, the, in the daytime you can kind of skirt around them a little bit mm -hmm. and pick up your course and keep on going. Normally, what uh, what altitude did you fly at? We weren't that high. We weren't that high. I'd say probably four or five thousand feet. Mm -hmm. And we flew over the over the Sahara. Of course, when you fly across the Bay of Benghazi in northern Africa, that's where the that's where Rommel and the British had a hell of a time, right? Just we were just south of El Alamein, mm -hmm. that whole area, and we could see trucks, gas dumps, airplanes, some good, some smashed, and a couple of times Hoppy and I went down and flew right off the desert, probably. Oh, I don't think we're 15 or 20 foot off the desert. Mm -hmm. Did you have any uh, close calls at all, or never? No. Never had one really. No, no one ever shot Never at you. Never had a single engine in North Africa or a blessed problem. Okay. And we used to. I think the name of the field in Cairo was John Payne Field, but I'm not sure. Okay. And 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 there was British planes there too, but it was in Cairo. And we spent a lot of time in Cairo because we laid over once in a while. Till we'd get a uh, some either freight or people to go back. Now. Uh, <coughs> During that time period, did you ever fly back to the States at all? No. Okay. When we left the States, that was it until we came back after the war. Or okay. at least me. And, and then eventually you started flying into the CBI theater? And it was Christmas of 1944. 
Yeah, Christmas Day, 1944, they posted it on the bulletin board. Hoppy came in, my first pilot, came in the barracks. He says, Harold, it looks like we're going to split up. I'm going to lose you. And I couldn't believe it. I said, what's the matter? He says, you've been posted to go to China. Well, everybody said that that was the worst place on earth you could go. So here we were, with, I was going. Mm -hmm. And they, they sent a lot of the co-pilots to China. Happy, I don't know what happened. He stayed there and flew. I think they eventually put him in C-54s, which was the four-engine uh, big sister to the C-47. Mm -hmm. So that I went, I went to China, and they flew us right into Chavo Air Base. At Chavo, I stayed. I didn't do any flying there. They, they, they got us ready, indoctrination into India, told us what to expect in India. And of course, at Chavo, they had a base hospital, which was, I think, about the only one in that area. Mm -hmm. And then I think within them probably a couple of weeks they transferred me up the road a few miles to a little base. Called, it was at, at Moenberry in the Assam Valley and it was the 1332nd Army Force Base Unit. That's mm -hmm. what it was, that was his uh, name. Now this was in China? No, this is in India. India, India. okay. Because when we, we flew from India over Burma right down to China. Mm -hmm. What was your impression of India? Well, of course, India was controlled by the British, and it's a, it was pretty sad. Mm -hmm. It was pretty sad. Our air base was right in the middle of a tea plantation. We, were, we had tea all around us growing in the fields, and of course there'd be everybody out there picking tea at certain times of the year. Mm -hmm. But, but the base was nice. I mean, I mean the food was marginal. That was the hardest part about it. I don't think if we had anything good, it came out of a can. I remember for Thanksgiving once we had canned turkey. We never had much of anything fresh. The the uh, we had powdered eggs. Mm -hmm. But I managed to get into town, and that's where I got a full indoctrination into Chinese food. Mm -hmm. Because there was a Chinaman in town, and we'd get a jeep and head to town and get some decent food once in a while. Mm -hmm. And once in a while, we'd make a raid on the on the uh, our uh, food officer it was a gentleman by the name of Captain T Bay. <laughs> and quite frequently, a can of food would come up missing, and we'd have it in the tent. I I don't know how many pilots we had on this base, but we had, we had 55 C-46s, three or four or five maybe C-47s, a couple B-25s that were there. Mm -hmm. And then they also used the base as a uh, stopping point for Chinese pilots at that particular time and, and French pilots. I don't know what they were doing over there, but they would bring in P-51s and they were on their way to China with them. Now, did you ever have to... Uh uh, transport Chinese troops? Yes, we had to evacuate Chinese troops. Shirley would tell you about that because I told her about that. She was talking about it yesterday as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Japs got the Chinese backed up and got them trapped. And I can't, it was in Paoshan, China. And that was spelled P-A-O-S-H-A-N. And uh, our CO was Colonel Rice. And the Colonel says, we've got to evacuate these Chinese. He says they're trapped and the Japs will kill them all. I can't remember how many there was, but we, I think we had four or five planes go down there, mm -hmm. 46s, and we, we flew them out. Now, when you flew them out, we, all we could do was load them in the plane and have them sit on the floor. And they'd have their kittles because they, two or three of them would carry these great big iron kittles that that's what they cooked their rice in. And the, None of them could speak Chinese, and there was usually one officer. I remember the officer that came with us was a Chinese lieutenant, and he carried a Mauser machine pistol. Mm -hmm. There's not many of them around, and today they're a collector's item. 
but he could speak a little English. But the hardest part was to keep the buggers in one spot because you hadn't, you couldn't fasten them down. We had about 50 of them in there, and you had to get off the ground, and you had to make sure they didn't move around or it would have changed the e equilibrium of your airplane. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't do as they were told, and they got sick. We had a, one hell of a mess. Uh -huh. When we got to where they were going, you'd have to take the hose and clean the plane out. It, it was a mess. But we got out, I don't know how many there was. I would, there, there had to be between 500 and 1,000 of them. And it took us, it, it didn't take us that long. I made two to three trips, I remember. Mm -hmm. And the Japs were advancing against them, so, so we got them out. And we also took out I remember flying some of the Murrow's Marauders out once, too. Mm -hmm. Now, what was it like flying the hump? Flying the hump could be beautiful or it could be a thrill. It was a combination of both. It depended on the weather. The, mm -hmm. the weather was the killer. We, uh, we flew night and day, rain or shine, fog. There was not much scent. There was no such thing really as a canceled flight that I can remember. Because the boys in China had to eat, we had nurses in China, they had to have supplies, we had to sit the bombs over, we had to take over the gasoline. At times I had, on the C-46, I can't remember, but it would be full of drums of gasoline. And they had, and the C-46 was designed so they could uh, strap the tanks, the, barrels of gas down onto the floor. They'd have rods with certain leverage that you could stick into a hole on the floor and clamp it down. Mm -hmm. And uh, But we flew over going from uh, uh, India to China. We flew over, I'd say, probably around four to 5,000 feet. Mm -hmm. Now coming back was a different story. 90% of the time we came back empty. And of course, they would give us just enough gas in China to get back because they didn't want to waste it. Because mm -hmm. we had to carry the gas over, and then we'd have to use gas to get back. So they didn't want to deplete their supplies that we brought over. Now, at, at that point, were you flying with the same, well, well were you the first pilot at that point? Or when still I first went pilot? over, I was a co-pilot, mm -hmm. naturally. You have to fly with a pilot to learn the routes, learn the radio frequencies. Uh, mm -hmm. And we hit not only one base in China, we may have hit, oh Lord, I think I've been into probably four, five, six. Mm -hmm. And the hills in China are like, not like mountains in this country. They can come right out of the ground like rocks. It's almost like a miniature Grand Canyon in a sense, mm -hmm. except that you haven't got the canyon but you've got rocks and, and you'd have to fly between them and you'd hope to God you could get through and, and if the wind was blowing you had another problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we flew into Kunming, Luliang, China, Chen Yi, Cheng Kung, and, and there's some more that I can't remember, of course Chadwa. But there was other bases there too that were going into China all the time. Did you normally fly with the same uh, crew? Crew or not really? No. I mean, and that was one thing that was a little tough. I mean, you might have a different co-pilot on each trip. Mm -hmm. You might have a different radio op, and that this way you had to get to know each other. And it, it was a handicap. I still say, after a while, we asked uh, a friend of mine by the name of Bill Schomer, who was a first pilot. After after I became I, I took my transition and learned how to become a first pilot and was approved by the Czech pilot. Mm -hmm. And then I flew uh, as, as a first pilot. But after a while, we realized there were certain times that we couldn't get the tonnage. And of course, our general in command out of Calcutta, he would kept pushing to increase the tonnage of goods and supplies to go to China. And I think the commanding general of the Pacific Command, whoever it was, I think it was Stratemeyer, kept pushing him to increase it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Well, this fr friend of mine who was another pilot, we came up with an idea that we could fly more if we put two first pilots in the same plane and we could go. So we flew, we flew constantly. We probably could get back, take a nap for, well, if we got back, it was around four hours going over and about four to five coming back and we probably would take our time and, and take a nap and then we'd take off again. Mm -hmm. And we got, we got a lot more time in by doing it that way and we, we requested that we have the same radio operator. Mm -hmm. Now, did you usually fly the same aircraft or? No. It was an impossibility to fly the same aircraft some of the time because these poor planes had a habit of breaking down a lot. Mm -hmm. Service in China, of course, spare parts were rare. And I don't know how in heck the, the crew chiefs in the engineering department kept these planes in the air mm -hmm. because they didn't have the parts. And quite frequently the plane would be loaded and you'd go out and get in it and you'd have to check it out and if you didn't feel as though it came up to specs you you would refuse it. Mm -hmm. Well of course the engineering department wasn't happy but you weren't about to take a plane off that you didn't think sure. would make the trip. So then you'd have to go and either cancel that flight, pick up another plane and go then they'd have to repair that plane and it was a constant battle. Mm -hmm. As I told Wayne earlier Everybody loved Pratt and Whitney engines. Curtis Wrights were good engines, but the Pratt and Whitney, those little girls would run whenever they could, and mm -hmm. they did. Of course, if it's an 18 cylinder engine with a little over 2,000 horsepower, and uh, it, was, it was a beautiful engine, mm -hmm. but, uh, but they did a good job. I, I will say the crew chiefs engineering did a good job. I don't know how in the hell they did it. They talk about uh, fixing up Model T's and Model A's with bailing wire. Well, I think they did the same thing with C-46's. Mm -hmm. Now, what sort of unit insignia did, did you have on your jacket? Well, all of the CBI pilots in the area had, had the A-2 leather jacket and most of us had the flags on the back that told, in case we had to go down or bail out or we crashed and managed to survive, it would tell the natives who we were, we were not Japanese, and to please take this pilot to the nearest base mm -hmm. or notify them or whatever. Now were those uh, flags uh, made out of leather or were they Silk or cloth? Well, they were a form of leather. leather. I've almost got a feeling that they were more or less goat skin or something like that. And mm -hmm. I don't know where they came from. But, and I don't even remember, I can't remember for sure. I don't think they were furnished by the Air Force. Mm -hmm. I think there was something that we put on with their approval, of course. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. It's outside of the insignia on the sleeve, your CBI patch, or, mm -hmm. and your Air Force patch on the other sleeve. Now, did you sew that uh, <clears throat> that patch on the back of the coat jacket, or was it on the inside? Is it is on the outside? On the outside. It's okay. on the outside on the back. Okay. And I I believe there was a jeez I can't remember I've got one and I told you I, but mm -hmm. I don't know right where it is but I think there was a, a replica of the Chinese flag on it and maybe. It may be the stars and stripes, mm -hmm. but some of the pilots did get back that bailed out. I know. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I didn't have to. A couple times I thought I'd have to. We had some single engines, but uh, some of the pilots got back. And of course, the biggest problem was their shoes were gone. They wore out, and their feet were a mess because the jungle just tears everything up. And that's all we had from from Burma right down to the edge of China was jungle. Mm-hmm. Were you over there uh, when the war ended? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that was in August. Uh, and we kept right on flying. Mm -hmm. We kept right on flying the hump. I remember there was times we didn't think we would have to, but 
the old Air Force says, well, we've got to still feed the boys in China. We've still got to stuff. We've got people over there. I remember once, I, this is kind of humorous in a sense, I went into the operations office to get my manifest. You had a sign for the airplane. Co-pilot and radio operator were with, were with me. And uh, I signed for the manifest, took the plane, went out on the plane, got on the plane, and I looked and I had a plane full of Kotex. And I said, my God, what the hell's happened? I went up front and I grabbed the, turned on the radio and picked up the mic and I called the tower and I asked him, I said, what's going on? And I said, my plane's full of Kotex. And the tower operator says, don't get excited, Lieutenant. It says uh, we need bandages in China. They ran out of bandages. Yeah. So that put a different light on it. Mm -hmm. But we flew over peanuts. I remember taking over a whole load of peanuts once. Well, you felt good about that because you knew the boys were going to have peanuts and cigarettes and what mm -hmm. the heck. But this was a. It was a labor of love. Mm -hmm. Did you ever? Uh Paul beer or whiskey or anything like that, Till? I might have. Uh, it was a funny thing. I didn't see much whiskey, although the the Colonel brought back some whiskey once in a while when he flew his B-25 down to Calcutta. And at that time I wasn't a drinker. I didn't like beer. Mm -hmm. Uh, I might take a little shot of whiskey once in a while, but of course that was something else. When you came off a mission and you landed, when you uh, went to the uh, operations to check in, you were required to go through the flight surgeon's tent, or, or in some cases he had a little bamboo basha, they called it, mm -hmm. and he, he gave everybody a shot of whiskey. That quieted you down. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know how many pilots we had on that field. I can't tell you for sure. Now, with your uh, resupplying, did you ever have to, uh, uh, instead of landing, just push the cargo out with the parachute hook to it? No. No? No, we never did a drop. Okay. I did. The only time we pushed stuff out the door is when we had a single engine and we didn't think we could maintain altitude. Mm -hmm. It depends. If you're over 10,000 feet, you need a lot of, you need a lot of uh, air to run those engines. Yep. And if you can't go fast enough to get the air, then you've got a problem. Well, what happened was, <coughs> quite frequently, as I told you earlier, those engines were tired. S some of them were running. They were all running good, but some of them weren't as good as the other ones. Mm -hmm. And once in a while, one would skip and buck, and pretty soon it had quit. Well, you had two choices. Either feather the engine so the blades were parallel to the wind, or let them windmill and maybe it would restart. But whatever the case was, it slowed you down, which means you're going to lose altitude. And if you can't get the blessed thing started, you're going to lose your plane crew, the whole business. Mm -hmm. So what you'd had to do, you had to tell the co-pilot and the radio operator to go back and start jettisoning stuff right out the door. Mm -hmm. It didn't make any difference where you were, which was probably over the jungle, and maybe maybe some natives got it. But mm -hmm. when we hauled up, when we rolled gasoline, we'd have to unhook them and roll out. Once in a while, a one of those barrels, when you got up to 10,000 foot, the pressure would create a leak and you'd have to throw it out because you can't have leak mm -hmm. no. gasoline running around the floor of the airplane. How often did you have to jettison cargo? Well, I don't know. Probably of all the missions I had, I probably did it about three or four times. Mm -hmm. Three or four times. And that was because of single engines, otherwise you wouldn't throw it out. Mm -hmm. And all those times we 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 got the engines running again. Okay. Sometimes it wasn't that bad that low flying say at ten thousand feet or, or below because it was warm temperatures. Coming back at night, we might be up to twenty some odd thousand mm -hmm. coming back. We come back the northern route. 
a couple of times coming back, I saw Mount Everest off to the north. There was a, wasn't any problem to see it at 28,000 feet, mm -hmm. but there you at there your temperatures are down. Uh, hell, I don't know. It wasn't that far from zero, mm -hmm. and we the planes all had heaters, but none of them ever worked. Mm -hmm. I never remember one plane with heaters that worked. Mm -hmm. Now, were you ever involved in any crashes at all? I crashed up one airplane in 1945, I think it was around in June. Uh, what happened was I took off in China and came back, and when you, uh, when you raise your wheels, you, uh, you tell the co-pilot, gear up, and he reaches down and hits the lever which brings the gear up. Well, as you're bringing the gear up, you hit the brake pedals because you don't want spinning wheels going into the nacelles because it could, if it happened to hit a brake line, you could rub right through it. Mm -hmm. So you'd hit the brake pedals and she'd go into the nacelles. Well, we came back to India and I put the wheels down and I came in and I don't know why I didn't do a wheel landing with the C-46. That, that particular day, I thought, for some reason, I just kept pulling the wheel back, cutting my airspeed down, and I brought the tail down for a three-pointer to bring it in on a three-point. But just as, just as the darn front wheels hit, the back end came up and we somersaulted down the runway, bottom side up. Now, when we got stopped, uh, First thing I noticed, the truck started coming up, and they start spraying the dirt in front of us in case of fire. Mm -hmm. And we looked, and we could see right out the bottom. It wore the top of the plane right the hell off. But we we unfastened our seat belts, the three of us, and fell out through the hole. Hmm. But uh, did you get hurt at all? No, no, I don't think I did. Mm -hmm. It was a it bothered me. It bothered me for a long time because it was such a surprise. I didn't sure. know anything was going to happen. But the funny part about it was uh, engineering thought it was my fault and they were going to do an investigation and see if they could find pilot error, which is mm -hmm. quite common. Well, I said, what the heck with it? I kept right on flying. but. Every time I come in for a landing, I was a little skittish, because mm -hmm. you often wonder. Well, it took about a month, I remember, and one day I was sitting in the officers' club, and we were having a sandwich there that they brought in to us, and, and the engineering officer, his name was Zero Neal, never forget it, hell of a nice guy. He was a pilot, engineering officer. He says, Harold, he says, guess what? I says, what, Zero? He says, they found dirt in the brake metering valve. He says, when you braked it in China, that pressure built up and never released. He says, you landed with full pressure against those wheels. He says, you're home free. He says, it wasn't your fault. He says, the engineering records show that that valve wasn't, cl wasn't cleaned. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of that. Yeah. So eventually, after the war ended, uh, <clears throat> how, how much longer were you over there before they sent you back to the States? Well, the war was over in August and we just kept right on flying. I mean, mm -hmm. nobody was very happy because nobody wanted to die after the war was over. Sure. Uh, but we didn't have any choice. I mean, you're an Air Force officer. You do as you're told. Mm -hmm. You gripe. But as, as everybody knows, that's a, everybody's happy when they're griping. Mm -hmm. If they're not griping, watch out. Mm. So when did they send you back home? Well, I would say they told us we were going home. Mm -hmm. And I would say it was sometime in November. Okay. Because we uh, they asked us how we wanted to go. If we wanted to fly back or whether take other transportation. Well, we didn't know what in hell they meant by other transportation, whether it was donkey, cart, or horseback. But anyway, it turned out that they said we could go back by ship. So we came, said, 
I don't know. Anyway, when we got to the ship in Karachi, India, there was about a thousand of us, I think, that, mm -hmm. that boarded that ship. Now, did your whole unit go go back at the same time, or did you go a back? Lot on of a... Us, a lot of us went back. A, a lot of them decided to fly back, and they went sooner. Mm -hmm. But you had to get in line. I don't know whether, I forgot what schedule they used to send the boys back. Mm -hmm. It might have been... A point system? Yeah, it might have been. But it wouldn't have done much good back then with the war being over. But anyway, mm -hmm. we, they flew us to Karachi, India, and they flew us to Calcutta, and then we flew us to Karachi. And then we got on a Swedish freighter, the HMS Torrens, I remember, T-O-R-R-E-N-S. And we came back through the Indian Ocean, up through the Red Sea, up through the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean past Gibraltar and came across the Atlantic and landed in Camp Shanks, New Jersey on December 7th, mm -hmm. 1945. Now at that point, was your wife still in uh, Missouri? She knew I was coming home, so she left Missouri and came to my folks' home here because mm -hmm. I, would be, I would be coming from Camp Shanks to uh, home. Okay. What was it like when you uh, reached the shores of the the United States I'm glad you asked that. It was a peculiar thing. We came into the harbor, New York Harbor, and everybody was on deck. Mm -hmm. Everybody. I think the poor old ship had about a five to ten degree list. Everybody was looking at the Salvation Army and the loudspeaker system was playing sentimental journey. You said Salvation Army? Did I? You mean the Statue of Liberty? The Statue of Liberty. <laughs> Okay. Salvation Army comes a little while later. Okay. I'll tell you about that too. Okay. But they were playing the sen sentimental journey all uh -huh. the way in, and it, guys were crying. Oh God! Ships came out with the fight with the water, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> and all we had on board, with, they were all Air Force, outside of a few infantry officers. I had made the acquaintance of three great guys. They were attached for three years to the Chinese infantry. They were from Ohio, all three of them. And if I remember correctly, they were all captains. And uh, Now what rank were you at that point? First lieutenant. Okay. First lieutenant. And uh, but we landed at Camp Shanks. And, well, it took, it took about a day to get, I don't know how they do things so, so fast. They got us all orientated, called us in, some of us, they said, some of you, is there any of you that live in New York State and in this particular area? And hands went up, and mine went up. They said, well, you gentlemen leave, go home. We'll call you when we want you, we know who you are, we've got your records. So I went home, I was home for Christmas, and I didn't hear from them until February. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to stay in. And I found out I would be stationed at Floyd Bennett Field, and I said, gee, I don't really want to stay in Floyd Bennett Field because there was already pilots there, and some of them were empty in waste baskets. They didn't, uh -huh. they didn't have anything for them to do. And my wife wanted me to stay in, and I said, no. I, so I got out. I probably should have stayed in because I love the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So you, you came back? Uh I came back civilian life. Yeah. And, and what did you do? Did you make use of the GI Bill? I did for a while. I did for a while. I took the readjustment allowance for a while until I could get a job. And I worked with my father on the farm and then I went back to Missouri and I became an insurance investigator. Mm -hmm. Went out to Shirley's home and that's where our first child was born. And then eventually I came back here. Been here ever since. but. Uh, Okay. Did I, I would have liked to stay in. In fact, I tried to, I tried to go. I was going to go to work for the airlines. Mm -hmm. But it, when you discharge a million and a half pilots, there's no jobs available with the airlines. They were all taken up. Yeah. Because we had a f hell of a mess of pilots in the Air Transport Command that were qualified to fly twin engine and four engine both. Mm -hmm. Did you stay in contact with any of the fellows you were in the service with? I did with? for a while, and then it kind of petered out. Okay. And it kind of 
I did. I had some friends that weren't too far away. There was one up in Glens Falls. They used to go see once in a while. But and then there was others. But I had one that was the briefing officer at Bowen Barry, and he lived in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I think he, the poor guy. Last I heard, somebody said he passed away. So. Okay. Did you attend any kind of reunions at all? No, not a one. Okay. Do you belong to any veterans organizations? I did. I I belonged to the uh, Legion for a while, mm -hmm. and then I uh, I dropped it a while back. When we went to Florida, I changed. I used to belong to the Masonic to, to Masonic Order in Cambridge. And okay. You getting low? Uh, I'm going. Actually, I'm going to. Uh, in a minute or so, put in uh, another film so we can look at your photographs. Okay. But uh, bri briefly, uh, how do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? That's a good question. Well, the peculiar thing, I've, uh, it had, it's had great bearing on my life. Mm -hmm. Everything is done. When I say I'll be there at 9 o'clock, I'll be there at 9 o'clock or 5 o'clock. It bothers me to, for, for people that say they're going to be at a certain place at a certain time and show up an hour late. I wish my son, for instance, would have learned this too. Mm -hmm. But you have to be in the service. I like the discipline in the service, but I was lucky. I was lucky. I was with the aviation cadets, and, and they were they were they were different people in a sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop uh, right here. Well, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Oh, yes. Yes. Yep. Well, well the, going in the Air Force was something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I had friends tell me, oh, you're not smart enough to go. You've got to have a college education. I remember a close friend of mine, I, he might have been jealous, too. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't really know whether I was qualified or not. But Were you a good student in high school? I could have been a better student. Let, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll let's say that. I enjoyed myself in high school. I enjoyed myself. I passed. I've never had to stay back a year in any grade. But my teachers always said, Harold, you're too darn nonchalant. You could do better. Well, I was pretty sure I could have done better, too. But then I wanted to fly. And when they told me I couldn't want to fly, all you have to do is somebody tell you you can't do something and you want to do it. Mm -hmm. That's also a, an attribute that a lot of females have. <laughs> but when I passed that test down at Albany in the post office, I knew I was on my way, but then I didn't realize how hard it could get after that. Mm -hmm. But I, I, uh, I loved the discipline. I can remember my drill master in Atlantic City just as though it was yesterday. And here he is with a bunch of kids that just left home. Their mother had to tell them when to brush their teeth, when to go to the bathroom, when to do this and when to do that. And he took over that job. Because mm -hmm. a lot of these kids, they didn't know what the hell was going on. I didn't either. Here I was with a bunch of strangers. At that particular time, I think I was, what, 19 or 20? Mm -hmm. And uh, and he was a, I can't remember his name, but I can see him just as though it was yesterday. You could see your face in his boots. He walked erect. He wore the campaign hat. He wore the dark greens all the time. Dark mm -hmm. greens with a campaign hat. And he had a voice, I'll tell you. We stood outside the hotel Traymore, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. Pouring rain, waiting for breakfast. Nobody griped, nobody bitched. You thought, what in the hell am I doing here? I could, I could be home, sitting at the table with mom giving me bacon and eggs. Mm -hmm. But we all got through it, and 
and I enjoyed the discipline. I really did. I, I liked it. I liked the Air Force. I enjoyed the people. And I tried to learn what was taught me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the way as most people, including you, will say that's how you got home. Mm -hmm. If you paid attention, you did what you were supposed to do, you, if you knew how to fly your plane, you did your emergency procedures as they were called for, and it helps you in later life. <clears throat> if you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer, you better know darn well what the hell you're doing or you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make any difference whether you're a clerk in a store, you do the best you can. Okay. Um, do you want to show us your yeah. photographs and tell us uh, approximately when and where those were taken? I'm pretty sure that these both were taken after graduation on May 23rd, 1944. Uh, they were pretty, pro I mean, they wanted pictures to put in the certain books, I guess. and. Uh, and they said you also want them to send home to your loved ones because mm -hmm. a lot of the boys were left immediately. Some got furloughs. I was lucky I did. A lot didn't and they were just transferred out. Uh, you asked me earlier about people that didn't make it. One thing about the Air Force was if they had one that wasn't going to make it or he acted up or he did something he wasn't supposed to do, you didn't know about it. He just didn't, he, his bed became empty. Mm -hmm. He left in the middle of the night. They were very careful about this. Why, I don't know. We just accepted it that he didn't make the grade. Something happened. Mm -hmm. they, they never advertised what the problem was or said anything about it. That just came to me a few minutes ago. So that's about the best I can do. Um, okay. You want to show some photographs in that, that album? Yeah. I don't know where the, how they're going to hold up here for you. These are some... Now this picture here that you can see, is that going to show up all right? In yep. The yep. This picture here was taken of the four pilots that I was with in North Africa. Okay. Hopper is the one that's sitting down. There's one to the left. His name is Philip Q. Cheswala. Uh -huh. He was a pilot too. He was an Osage Indian chief from Oklahoma. And he was a great pilot. Mm -hmm. And he was just as good in his off hours as not. Being an Indian, we have we had to watch out for him when we got into the fire water. <laughs> the other one is uh, Ward. His name is Ward. He's another Indian. He was from Oklahoma too, with a peculiar coincidence. But Cheswala, I understand his grandmother owned two or three oil wells in Oklahoma, so. The chief, as we called him, was pretty well set. Uh -huh. Whatever happened to him after the war, I have no idea. And uh, let me see who the other one was. Well, believe it or not, it's me. Okay. It's the one on the right-hand side. But we were all buddies. But as I said before, my uh, my first pilot, Milton O. Hopper, is the gentleman sitting down. Okay. All right. So. This over here is another pilot. His name was Joseph Gillis. I, un I understand he ended up as a, some sort of a judge in Detroit, Michigan. Joseph, uh, Joseph Gillis. Joe was a service pilot, a captain, and a damn good pilot. Not many service pilots became captains. Mm -hmm. Most of them were flight officers, I said before. Some were second lieutenants, but most of them were flight officers. Okay. And the rest are just pictures of people that I flew with. Tony Gabriels, he was from Michigan. And uh, different. There's a CBI patch down in the left-hand corner. Okay. 
that's a little paper patch that my wife put in there. Okay. I think everybody that was in the CBI was pretty proud of the CBI. Mm -hmm. There's some natives. There's some natives that we we had on our base. They came to work. Some of them worked in the mess hall. Some of them would even uh, do the wash. They did the washings and stuff for us. Uh huh. The, we were instructed by our CO that we could not pay them too much because the British didn't want us to ruin their pay scale, which wasn't about two annas a day, which is about five or ten cents if I remember oh, correctly. Yeah. Uh, the British didn't want us to corrupt their morals. <laughs> These are some, let's see, I think these pictures here, well, there's a picture of the bottom of, underneath the C-46. Here, let me get it back here for Wayne. Okay. It's kind of hard to look at them in a book. Uh, okay, I got it. C-46, and this is a, uh, in training. These are primary pilots that I was with in Bennettsville, South Carolina. Well, we were flying uh, other planes. Okay. There's some there. There's four of my, the, 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 those four, one of them is me, the other three are my roommates in Bennettsville, South Carolina in 1940, early, late 43, early 44. We were flying then all four of us were flying Stearmans. Okay. But I think that's about it. And these pictures are my family that remained home on the farm during the war. Okay. Now, you got, is there any other pictures you want? Well, I, th I think that uh, covers it. Uh, you want to just uh, <coughs> show us your logbook that you kept? Okay. Here's a log book I carried. I believe this one was just in India when I got there. I've got another log book. I forgot to tell Wayne. Oh, hold on a second here. I... The red light's still on though. Yep, somehow I got the photo. Let me stop this here. I hit the photo button. Red lights. wheels coming for me. Okay. I have them bring me a meal every day because I'm a lousy cook. Okay. I can boil water and cook bacon and eggs <coughs> and that's it. Okay. We're, we're rolling again here. You're rolling? Yep. That a boy. This is my log book. Definitely just for China. Starting in, uh, let's see, let me get this straight. January 19th, 1945. Right till I finished, probably in late August or September of '45, when the war with Japan was over. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned uh, in your other records you were showing me, you had uh, how many round trips in the in the hump? Eighty-five. Eighty-five. Eighty-five round trips in the hump, flying the hump. We, as I told you earlier in the recording, I was flying this other this other first pilot by the name of Bill Schomer, and I flew together. We told the colonel we thought we could increase flight if we put two f uh, first pilots in the plane, mm -hmm. and uh, it would uh, cut down the time the plane was idle because I could rest a little bit, he could rest a little bit, and we would know what to do, and our, we requested also that we could keep the same radio operator, mm -hmm. because we, be, we became accustomed to him, he knew us. In fact, once he even offered to act as my co-pilot. I had a co-pilot that slept the whole damn trip, and was not much help to me coming back. He was a flight officer, and uh, 
I remember his name, but I'm not going to mention it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and I told the radio opera, I says, God, I says, what am I? I says, I need some help when we get there because the weather was not good and he was sound asleep. I says, get him out of the chair and you you get in there. So my my radio op acted as my co-pilot, called the tower, put the wheels down, and did everything mm -hmm. that I needed to be done. And the other guy woke up and he was madder than hell. And then when we got off the plane, he he had the nerve to ask me if I would recommend him for first pilot. I just turned around and walked away in disgust. <laughs> I would have recommended my co-pilot for anything, or uh -huh. my, my radio operator for anything. Mm -hmm. But I forgot to tell you earlier that in between leaving and going, when we went to, to Atlantic City for BASIC, they had a new program, and I'd forgotten all about it until just a few minutes ago. And that was, they sent us from Atlantic City to a college training detachment. Oh. And as luck would have it, they shipped me to Amherst, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And there was, I don't know how many there was of us. I'd say there was probably 75 to 100 of us. We took over two barracks of Massachusetts State College, beautiful colonial brick buildings, two floors, and uh, there was, I think, two to, at least two of us in each room. We had desks, everything to study. We went to Massachusetts State College. They taught us. Uh, we had mathematics. We had meteorology. And they started us on code. That's where we started with code. Because mm -hmm. we didn't know dit from da or da from dit. Mm -hmm. By the time we left there, we had a take and we had a take and transmit so many words per minute, or we couldn't, you couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. How long were you there for? I'd say about two months. Uh -huh. it, was, it was a beautiful thing, really. It was just gorgeous. Uh, the, the campus in Amherst College is still there, and I, I think that's now called the University of Massachusetts, but I'm not sure. Back then it was Massachusetts State College. Mm -hmm. Now, did you attend classes in uniform? Yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. We were all in uniform. Everybody was in uniform. It was just like the Army. The barracks, we were called out at certain times in the morning. It was a little bit more relaxed. I mean, you were freedom. Had a, we, we ate in the college mess hall. It was just, I mean, it was heaven, really. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because camp uh, down in Atlantic City was tough. Yeah. <clears throat> there was a lot of rain down there because we were down there. It was in January and February. Mm -hmm. But after we left there, that's when we went to Nashville. Okay. All right. I remember one boy committed suicide down there. Really? I, nobody ever knew why. <clears throat> I don't know whether he just got discouraged or what. Uh, he just jumped out of the uh, second floor. These colonial buildings were brick, mm -hmm. kind of a chambrel roof with a with a cupola on top with a weather vane. And at the end of the top floor, there was doors went out on a little balcony. Well, he jumped from the balcony. It was, as far as I remember, I, that's all I remember. Yeah. It was it was kind of a discouraging thing, but I do remember remember it. I did, and I don't remember even who it was or whether I even knew him. Mm. I don't think I did. I think it was in the other barracks that I wasn't in. But uh, we went. In fact, we went from there too. By the way, and I've got that book. They sent us to Westfield, Mass., to take uh, to fly in uh, Piper Cubs and Porterfield Porterfield Turner planes. Mm -hmm. They'd fly us down and they take us down by bus to the field in Westfield, and uh, we had instructors there. What did you think of the Cub? I loved it. <laughs> loved it. Still do. Uh -huh. I've flown into one down here at Chapin Field in uh, Cambridge once in a while. I used to have a close friend that belonged to the club down there. He wanted me to join. I said, no, I'm not going to join. And uh, he joined, and he got his private pilot's license. And nothing would do. He'd have to take me up, and we'd go up together. It just so happened he died with a massive stroke. In fact, he was a 
he was the biology and the phys ed teacher in Cambridge High School. Oh. And he died on his birthday in 1971. Oh. <clears throat> but uh, I like the Cub. The Porterfield Turner, I don't remember too much about it. It, w it was a little different plane than the Cub. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. But the instructor I had was a dimwit. He, uh, he evidently had a good thing working for the government. I, do, I wouldn't have minded that, but I was there to learn how to fly, and he used to come in sometimes and he'd have a hell of a hangover. In fact, he'd still be half in the bag. And he'd go up with me, and sometimes he'd even fall asleep, and I'd turn around and his head would be hanging down on his chest. But when nothing ever happened, of course, he always got back and landed the plane, but I got fed up with it, so I went to the office and turned him in. Nobody ever said anything, they just gave me a different instructor that knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. But I figured as long as I was there, I was going to make use of it. Sure. I, when you're flying in an airplane, you're flying, you're flying with some angel anyway. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, before we close, is there anything else you'd like to touch on that uh, maybe we missed or something you'd like to add? Oh, dear. Well, it probably is, but I can't think of what it might be. But it's just, uh, I appreciate this, and it's been nice of Wayne to come. And I'm glad they, they finally decided to uh, record some of the experiences that people have had before we lose them all. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful experience. I, uh, I was fortunate to receive the DFC and the Air Medal for our work. Mm -hmm. Quite a few of us in China got it. In fact, more got it than didn't, I believed, as long as you paid attention. And uh, I didn't realize that after I smashed up that at one airplane, I thought maybe, but I received a promotion from second lieutenant to first lieutenant. And then before I left, uh, I was included in orders for the Distinguished Flying Cross and Cross and the Air Medal. And uh, that was quite a surprise too. But, uh, and they promised me it, they said it, and <laughs> it never made much bearing on me. I just thought it was so much hot air. They told me if Floyd Bennett Field, if I'd have stayed in a little longer, come back and didn't res uh, take my discharge, I probably would be eligible to be promoted to captain within a year. But. How many times have people heard that and it didn't work out anyway? But I didn't let it. I didn't let it affect my final decision to take my discharge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Thank you very much.